John chats with Kendra and Kat. Just a couple of girls talk about this and that. Getting familiar with blue and the charm ones too. John chats. Welcome to Charm Chats with Kendra and Kat. Mm. Woo! We are on episode 120. 120. The Power of Two, which aired on May 12th, 1999. Yeah. This is uh, an interesting episode because, as the name suggests, it's mainly focusing on just two of the sisters. Mm -hmm. That is because Holly Marie Combs had to have an operation for uterine fibroids, which kind of sucks. Mm -hmm. But, you know, better to get it taken care of. This is true. Yeah. So she mostly took the week off and Mm -hmm. only had, I think, two... Three, Two, three scenes? Three scenes. Three scenes. Three scenes. All of which were probably filmed... The same day. Yeah. Yeah. So, because Piper isn't really in this episode, this is the first episode where no one gets frozen. Yeah, that's that's weird. Yeah. It's a little odd. But you deal. Like, you don't really notice it very much. That mm-hmm. no one gets... Like, it's not a, a big deal. It's yeah. It's just a thing that just doesn't happen. You know? Yeah. So, once again, as per usual, we apologize if anyone is moving around upstairs. I don't think so, because... Your roommates seem to be being very nice now. Well, one of them is not here. Yeah, one of them isn't here, and the other one is very, very considerate, and Mm -hmm. I enjoy him immensely. Mm -hmm. Yes. (laughs) He saw me pull out the hair dryer, Mm -hmm. or rather, he saw the hair dryer was still out when I left to go do something, because I had to shower at a weird time and then immediately leave. Yeah. Because I was cheating on you with another podcast. Um, (gasps) How dare you? What podcast? My friend's podcast. Pixels and Pints. Oh, yeah. very cool. I was so, like, we might like, as well give them a shout out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I gave I gave us a shout out on there. So Awesome. Yeah. But like, I didn't want to go outside with wet hair, so I pulled out the hair dryer. And when I got back home, he's like, were you on a date? <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> what would, Why what? would you think that? What? It's like, oh, the hair dryer. You dried your hair. And I'm like, yeah, because it's cold out. You dried your hair. Yes. Because it's cold out and you don't want your hair to freeze mm-hmm. in the cold. That's true. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I was reporting on the John Hodgman ruling on hot dogs as sandwiches. What but was his ruling? They are not. I get that ruling only because a bun is one piece of bread. Yes, even though it's hinged and you could have like a po' boy or a meatball sub. Mm-hmm. That would be considered a sandwich. His his idea is that because you would not normally cut a hot dog in half to share. All right. Well, it's one of his reasonings. I, that's a good reasoning, though. I enjoy that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yes, Luke and Mel were arguing about, you know, is a hot dog a sandwich? And Luke's like, oh, it's totally a sandwich. And Luke's like, a hot dog is not a sandwich. <laughs> and if they weren't engaged, I'd worry they'd break up. <laughs> So I mentioned John Hodgman because you did it on the Judge John Hodgman podcast. And then I'm like, you know what? You know, I, I'm not going to make you guys research this. I'll do the research and I'll come on the podcast and I'll let you know. Nice. So I did. And apparently one of the people who's normally on the podcast and wasn't there that week tweeted about how his phone keeps trying to correct Hodgman to something else. And John Hodgman liked it and he's like, I'm best friends with Hodgman. And I'm like, bitch, when you spend four hours in a hot tub with him, you can talk to me. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Shut up. Yeah. I have seen you already. Yes. All right, so we should get into the episode because there is going to be a lot of wiki tangenting in a short period of time before and after the opening credits, and I apologize for nothing. So we start Mm -hmm. with the exterior shot of Halliwell Manor. We go inside. Piper is in a purple hoodie over a grayish purple shirt with a light gray skirt. It's kind of flowy. Mm -hmm. And she's wheeling a suitcase. Phoebe is wearing jeans and a V-neck short sleeve top with a stripe pattern that follows the V of the shirt in shades of blue. So kind of chevrons. Kind of. Reverse chevron. Yeah, kind of. She is sitting cross-legged on a table in a meditation stance. Fingers out and everything. Prue, coming out of the kitchen, is wearing a three-fourth sleeve gray top with a scoop neck and a very short black skirt. Mm -hmm. Not quite mini, but very short. Yeah. And Prue and Piper are kind of, you know, running around the house, freaking out, because Piper's really gotta leave, and she's Mm -hmm. almost late, and she can't find all these things, like her plane ticket. Yeah. And Phoebe, over on the table there, 
holds up various items. I think what was it? it was it was uh, was a, there a, a set of keys? Yeah, like a set like of keys, a, a lipstick, yeah. and finally the plane Piper's ticket. plane ticket. Yeah, and she gets a premonition off of the plane ticket of a plane taking off and Piper looking very annoyed. Yes, and um, she's really excited that she she apparently you know forced this premonition to happen, and so she's like really really happy as. Prue snatches the plane ticket out of her hand, and she's trying to explain, like, why this is exciting, as Piper's like, dude, why the fuck did you have my plane ticket? Yeah. She's like, and, and she chastises her for being on the furniture. Yeah. Like, why are you on the table? But, yeah. So, she tells him that she's been practicing trying to call a premonition, and it worked. And that's the good news. The bad news is that the premonition was Piper missing her plane. Yep. <laughs> missing her flight to Honolulu. Where she's apparently going for some kind of con- convention. convention. Yeah. And if she doesn't go there, her boss will fire her. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know what kind of a convention a restaurant manager needs to go to in Honolulu. Honolulu. Yeah, but, I But, know. you know, you gotta find some way to get Holly out of the episode. Yeah, and, like, I, I swear that somebody just had... And affinity, like, they wanted to bring in, like, something Hawaii. Like, they wanted her to come in with a lay. Because, yeah. like, there, there was no reason to send her to Hawaii. Yeah. You know, other than the fact that it was... A lot closer uh, from California. Yeah. But, like, they could have sent her to just about anywhere. Send her to Chicago. Send her to, you know, like, anywhere else. But, nope, Hawaii. Chicago okay. would have been a good place for a restaurant manager. Mm-hmm. There could have been anything at McCormick Place. True. But, you know, whatever. <laughs> Apparently, Prue's job is also hanging by a thread. Mm-hmm. Because... Due to all the demon hunting time off she's been taking. But we don't see Prue taking a whole lot of time off. It's mentioned a lot that she's just not going into Buckland's that day. Like, yeah. Like... It's never mentioned that Piper is not going into Quake. Like, I think a couple of times she tries to not go into Quake and gets pulled in anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But with Prue, I know it's mentioned a lot where she's just like... Yeah, I'm not going into work today. Yeah. So, I don't know. I guess. So Piper is continuing to freak out because she's just remembered a bunch of other stuff she hasn't done. Like like her hair appointment. Yeah. She hasn't canceled it. Because, you know, it's a bit difficult to have a hair appointment without the hair being at the appointment. Yeah. Or the person attached to the hair. Yeah. That is so, uh, yeah. quite, quite difficult. Yeah. And I guess she picks up the vase that Phoebe put on the stairs. Yeah. Yeah. Which I thought was kind of funny. Yeah, but she's got like, like a whatever. she got a whole a whole list little mm-hmm. list there, and Phoebe's trying to calm her down and says, "Oh yeah, yeah I'll don't get worry, it done. I'll get it done." And Piper's like, "You will." <laughs> and, and, and Prue and says, Prue, "Yeah, she's got time." Mm-hmm. Which you know that that one's gonna come back at her, you know. Uh-huh. And it wasn't exactly said in the condescending way. It, it's it just wasn't. like, "Oh, oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah she's you, got you time. Probably, you probably have the time to do this. So would would you?" Yeah, exactly. But she just left off the, would, would you? you? Yeah. And then she says that they stopped Phoebe's premonitions before, so they can try to do that again. And Piper then realizes that Prue and Phoebe haven't really ever been alone together since they've been adults. Yeah. But Phoebe says that they don't need her as a buffer anymore they're because big they're girls. big girls. Yeah. And then there's this great scene yes. where... Prue and Piper just keep, like, circling around each other and turning around to tell Phoebe to do more stuff as they're heading toward the door. Yeah. It's real cute. It was cute. And I I enjoyed the little moment where Piper asks what happens if they need the power of three, and Prue says then the power of two will just have to do. And Phoebe gives her, like, ooh, yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. It was a cute sister moment, and I really enjoyed it, because, like, you could tell that they were having fun together in a nice way. Uh Uh-huh. So... They so, ask her to do a few more things. She goes, fine, I'll just add it to my list. Poking the list with mm-hmm. her finger. And then they, they thank they, her and they leave. They didn't actually say anything, but I got the impression like Prue was going to have to magic some red lights or something. Yeah, probably. Yeah. And but then Phoebe, 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 Phoebe was like really a, salty. Yeah, she seemed a little salty about it. But she has a lovely line of, I'm not even married and already I'm a housewife. <laughs> Which was kind of funny because it kind of made me think of myself a little bit. Because mm-hmm. now, six years ago... When I lost my job and I, I you know, mm. moved with my parents and, like, helping out with my dad being sick. And so I kind of became a housewife of, like, I'm doing the, the grocery shopping and the 
you know, stuff. So it was just, it was a little funny to me. It was like, yeah, I'm not even married. No, mm-hmm. I'm a housewife. But, you know. You know, Phoebe is saved by the ringing bell of the telephone. Mm-hmm. And it's apparently her friend Marianne, Marianne, who we've never heard of before and will never hear from again. Fortunately, she doesn't have any lines, so we're not she has, worried. She has a single line. What? Yeah. What? She has a single line of, oh my God. She has a single line. I don't count that. Yeah. That's not, that's, no. an, that's an exclamation. That's not a sentence. Yeah. But I she, mean, yes, but it is she, a sentence, but. But she does have a SAG card. I did look her up. Oh, man. But apparently, Marianne and Phoebe had plans to go visit Alcatraz, Alcatraz. that she'd forgotten about. Yeah. She looks at the list, and she's like, oh, well, I maybe go. I... And then she's like, ah, fuck it. No, let's go. Yep. She goes, I'll be right there. She hangs up the phone, and then she scrunches up the list and throws it on the floor. Like, kind of chucks it into the next room, which was kind of funny. And then we get a dissolve shot from Phoebe's back. Onto Alcatraz Island. What noise are you making? You making some noise? Shush, Blue, I need to tangent. So it is now wiki tangent time. Mm-hmm. So Alcatraz Island, mm-hmm. as y'all might know, is located in the San Francisco Bay. Yeah, it approximately is approximately 1.25 miles offshore of San Francisco. Mm-hmm. According to a 1971 documentary on the history of Alcatraz, the island measures 1,675 feet by 590 feet, and the total area of the island is reported to be 22 acres. Mm. That is a very large island. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, Alcatraz Island was developed with facilities for a lighthouse, military fortification, a military prison, and then a federal prison that was operated from 1933. Oh, so this is in succession. Yeah. Okay, so not all at the same time. It's no. not a large enough island for all that shit. Yeah, no. There was the military prison, which I believe was in, like, 1860-something? 1869, I think, okay. to, like, 1910, I think. Not completely positive on that, because I didn't write down everything. Because there was what? a lot of you stuff. You didn't write down oh. everything? Oh, there's a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. And I knew I was going to be tangenting a lot, so I did cut out some stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, there will be links to the wikis on the website. But yeah, the Alcatraz Citadel was the military prison. I'm going to put a link to that on the website for anyone who wants to read about the military prison stuff because it's interesting. But I'm going to tangent enough that I couldn't put in that as well. So Alcatraz Island is the island itself. The prison on top of the island is Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary. It was designed to hold prisoners who continuously cause trouble at other federal prisons, and it was one of the world's most notorious and best-known prisons over the years. It housed somewhere around 1,576 of America's most ruthless criminals, including, just to name a couple, Al Capone, Machine Gun (laughs) Kelly... Bumpy Johnson and Creepy Carpus. Oh my god. Who Creepy Carpus served more time in Alcatraz than any other inmate. How long? I don't know. I didn't because I knew, like I said, that I was going to be tangenting a lot, I didn't really look them up as much. But there will be links to their wiki pages on the website, plus a few other interesting characters. So you can read more about them for yourself. Because if I wanted to tell you all of the interesting things about them, this podcast would be eight hours long, even after editing. So their lives were fascinating to read about. So I hope that you'll check out the links. But yeah, I'm not going to tangent on them because we would be here forever. So a total of 36 prisoners made 14 escape attempts during the 29 years of the prison's existence. Which means we have... No, okay, no, that wouldn't make for repeat offenders. Never mind. Mm-mm. The most notable of which were the violent escape attempt in May of 1946, known as the Battle of Alcatraz, and the arguably successful escape from Alcatraz from June of 1962 in one of the most intricate escapes ever devised. And oh, that's, that's that's the one the Mythbusters yeah. tested out. Yeah, back in 2003. Mm-hmm. They found it something plausible. It was, it was something like a raft made out of raincoats or yeah, some shit. Absolutely. Again, the links to all of those wiki pages are on the website, so check them out. Alcatraz yeah. closed on March twenty first, nineteen sixty three, because they had really high maintenance costs mm-hmm. and a completely poor reputation. Which is funny though, because they actually had like really good food. They were really nice well, to all the prisoners. W- probably wasn't running it then. Well, no, but, well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Okay, so, Aramark, for anyone wondering, 
is a food service company that does like catering for various institutions, including prisons and universities. Mm hmm. So apparently they have five levels of catering service. Mm hmm. The top level would be like diplomat shit, like foreign officials, like, you know, if you're catering the fucking White House or something. Mm hmm. And then there would be like executive business thingies. I don't know what the third level is. The bottom level is prisons. The next level up is universities. Nice. And yeah. so that's the food I got. Nice. Uh huh. Yep. Although the one day they brought in the kids from the culinary school learning to make sushi. That was a good day. Nice. But they weren't Aramark people, so that's why it was. Anyway, Alcatraz had single cells. They didn't have more than one person in a cell. Mm -hmm. What was their capacity? Did you write 312. That okay. That's not large. It was either, well, it was either 312 or 322. But I want to say it was 312. I will say that 10, being a margin of error, is fine for now. Yeah. Anyway... They had privacy. Each of the inmates had their own privacy because they had their own space. Mm -hmm. They had good food. They were treated really well, actually. So, like... Well, because it was, it was a prison for the high profilers. Yeah, exactly. So, like, if if they didn't get good treatment, mm -hmm. everyone would know. Whereas yeah. nowadays in the prison industrial complex... Yeah. Pretty much no one gets good treatment. Very true. Although the prisons that are starting the dog training programs are my favorite yeah those are nice uh-huh yeah you'll want to you'll want to look up prison dog training because it's it's so cute <laughs> basically like inmates live with a dog that is from a high-risk shelter mm -hmm. and they take classes and they train it to get it ready to be adopted out and that's cool it's kind of like job training because you know they learn they learn a skill and they learn how to take care of something else and it's really sweet, and it always makes me cry, and I'm tearing up a little bit right now just thinking about it. Aww. Because puppies. Yeah. So, in 1972, Alcatraz became a national recreation area and received designation as a National Historic Landmark in 1986. Today, the island's facilities are managed by the National Park Service, hence the reason why her tour guide is wearing a park ranger yeah, uniform that's what when I we get there. Yeah. I've seen the same thing in the Hamilton documentary. I didn't watch it yet. Oh, it's on my DVR. It's great. I know. It's, it's on but my like, DVR. They, they go to some of the historic houses and stuff, and there's always a park ranger showing them through the house. Nice. When there's not a lady in costume. Yeah. Nice. And it is part of the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. It is open to tours, which is kind of cool. Visitors can reach the island by ferry ride from Pier 33 near Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco. Hornblower cruises and events. Is that run by Horatio? No, I don't believe so. No. Hornblower Cruises and Events operates under the name of Alcatraz Cruises. They are the official ferry provider to and from the island. Because why wouldn't they be? Yeah, might as well keep your brand up. Yeah, absolutely. Alcatraz didn't just house criminals. It also housed the prison staff and their families. So at any given time, there were about 300 civilians living on Alcatraz, including both women and children. Wow. With all of these high-profile criminals. But the primary living areas for families were building number 64. They had three apartment buildings, one large duplex, and four large wooden houses for senior officers. Families had their own bowling alley, a small convenience store, and a soda fountain shop for the younger Oops. island residents. Hey, you spelled that wrong. It should have two P's and an E. I took it from Wiki. Well, they spelled it wrong. Sure. We should go edit it. Okay, go for it's, it. It's a soda fountain shop. That's a, a, a S-H-O-P-P-E. Okay. Obviously. Anyway, families did most of their shopping on the mainland because the prison boat made 12 scheduled runs to the Van Ness Street Pier each day. The warden lived in a large house adjacent to the cell house and actually used inmates with good conduct records for cleaning and cooking, which is just... I don't feel good about hilarious. that. Yeah. That... Mm, oh, no. That's... Yep. That's sketchy. <laughs> But it worked. It might have worked, but that's super fucking sketchy. Yep. All right. Are you ready for a moment of show before another tangent? I hope so. Okay. Because it's going to be the shortest amount of show before another tangent. We see in Alcatraz a woman wearing a black robe type dress that has a thick red trim at the wrists with big black buttons. Thick gold trim around the bottom and the collar that has like a squared spiral pattern. Mm-hmm. With thin red trim on that, and what looks like a corset-type belt around the middle. 
She's barefoot and floating in air inside a cell. As you do. Mm Mm-hmm. She's talking to someone named Jackson, who is wearing a blue-colored shirt, black pants with cuffs at the ankles, and, like, thick black boots. All right. Back to tangent time. Mm Mm-hmm. We never learn the black robe woman's name, but the actress is Brenda Bakke, B-A-K-K-E. I'm not sure if it's Bakke or Bake. I'm honestly not sure. It might be Bakke. Bakke, yeah. I don't know exactly how to pronounce that one. But she's been in a bunch of single episodes of stuff, including CSI, Dollhouse, Supernatural, Criminal Minds. She's Susie on that from an episode I haven't watched. Mm -hmm. And Criminal Minds Beyond Borders. So she's still acting. She started acting in 1986, and she's still doing stuff now, including a movie called Billy Boy that's coming out sometime in 2017 with Jim Beaver from Supernatural. Oh, she was on Dark Angel. Oh, I missed that. Yeah. Oh, well, a single episode, that's why. She's also in a movie called Unbelievable with five exclamation points. Oh, my God. Which has a bunch of people, including John Billingsley, which is the only reason I'm mentioning it, just so I can make a joke about it with Kendra. Huh? John- oh, yeah! <laughs> Inside jokes. Yeah, Inside jokes. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> she was on 18 episodes, probably all of the episodes, of American Gothic from 95. Okay. It's not a show I know, so I didn't bother writing it down. Huh. But I'm not going to go on a wiki rant about her because there's not a whole lot of stuff interesting about her. But Jackson is played by Jeff Colbert, and he's been in a bunch of stuff, including oh my God. Buffy and Criminal Supernatural. Lines. Criminal Minds, for sure. Yep. Actually, let me, let me look him up. Most people will know him from Sons of Anarchy or The Walking Dead, because that's what he's been on recently. But I know him from Kindred the Embraced. Kindred the Embraced was an Aaron Spelling show from 1996 that only had one eight-episode season. It was based on the White Wolf game Vampire the Masquerade, and I loved it because Vampire the Masquerade was my jam, and I miss playing it. But that's a topic for another podcast, because I could tell stories of my vampire games for, like, months, I'm sure. Anyway, they only had one season because the lead actor died in a motorcycle crash. And it's hard to have oh, a show... did you show me about this before? I think I did, yeah. It's hard to have a show with vampires, the main character, when the actor dies. Yeah, you did tell me. It's not like you can recast it, you know? This is true. This is so, true. but I have it on DVD, and it's amazing. Ooh, he was in that one movie that Jennifer Lopez was in that I keep wanting to rewatch. Okay. Called Enough. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice. Anyway. Oh, yeah, and it was two different people in Susan. Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Buffy, yeah. Yeah. He's one of my favorite people. And Jeff Colbert, along with Willem oh, Dafoe. He was, he was in both Star Trek Enterprise and Star Trek Voyager. Mm-hmm. Fun. Both Jeff Colbert and Willem Dafoe are my two, like, celebrity crushes where I just look and go, I don't find you physically attractive, but something about you I just really enjoy. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, I don't find them to be that cute, but, like, somehow there's just something, something there that I'm just like, yes, I would give you the time of day. Okay. Oh, his character name in Kindred was Daedalus? Daedalus, yeah. <laughs> Daedalus. He was a Nosferatu. Okay, so enough for now. Back to the show. The black robe lady, floating woman, whatever we want to call her because we don't have a name for her yet. She and Jackson are chatting about him wanting to get off the island, and he thinks he can find his own way, but she says that he's been stuck here for 36 years ever since his execution. I will save my sidetrack on that. We will come back to it later. Jackson says that he's learned how to do things in the past 36 years, including breaking the physical plane. And then he passes through the bars of the cell and says he is preparing for his revenge, which she thinks is very mortal of him. (laughs) I thought that was kind of funny. Yeah, and her voice has, like, this weird echo effect going on. Yep. He tells her to go to hell, and she's like, well, that's what I do, but never alone. And we learn that she ferries souls to hell, everyone she can get her little hands on. (laughs) Which, I think, in Greek mythology, wasn't the... Charon. Yeah. Charon, yeah. yeah. That's the ferryman. Yeah. I'm not going to call her that, because... It's not well, you exactly could call her Sharon. Thing. Sharon. Because actually that's how some people pronounce it. I pronounce it Sharon or Karen or yeah. Karen or... That was a Criminal Minds episode all in of itself. It was like mm-hmm. one of the first ones yeah. where they had someone calling in with a, a vocoder thing going on and they're like, I do this for Sharon. Oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Karen, yeah. Sharon, what, what the fuck are they talking about? And then they realized, oh, they're talking about the ferryman. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. So yeah, so she ferries souls to hell... I have no idea what I'm going to call her. It'll either be... I'll just call her Sharon. You do that. 
It'll either be like... Fun fact, I have both an Aunt Sharon and an Aunt Karen. Well... So either way, she's my aunt. There you go. Just don't call her auntie, because I can't. Oh, now I'm going to do that. Oh, please don't. Hey, you brought this on yourself. Please don't. If you hadn't mentioned it, I wouldn't have thought to do it. Please don't. Okay. Well, auntie doesn't really want Jackson's soul. I'm going to I'm going to cut it out and you're just going to no. you're going to yeah, no. I'm going to edit out every time you say it. No. And it'll just you be like not. doesn't want so. <laughs> no. Yep. You know why you won't? Cuz I'm putting this on fucking Instagram. <laughs> that that will not stop me from cutting it out. I'm the one that edits. Yes, but then everyone will have evidence. I care not. So from here on out, whenever Kendra mentions the Black robe woman. You won't hear a single word because I'm going to edit it out every single time she says something. IMDb page calls her the soul collector. Anyway, so black robe lady says that she fairy souls to hell, everyone she can get her little hands on. And Jackson tells her that she's not going to get her little hands on his soul, but she says that she doesn't want his soul. She wants a witch's soul because apparently they're like trophies, you know, as you do. Jackson wants to know how he plays into her plan, and she tells him that she'll help him get off the island, and when witches come to stop him, which she apparently knows that they will, then she gets a crack at getting the witches. And then she sees a group of people, including Phoebe, coming up toward the cell with a tour guide. The tour guide is wearing a brown park ranger uniform with a wide brim hat, because, you know... Run by the park service. Exactly. This actor is Sean Hannigan, And he's been in a bunch of things. I'm not going to go on a crazy tangent, but I had to bring him up. Exactly. (laughs) I had to bring him up because he was on a little show called Wishbone. Do you know Wishbone? Yes, we do. Okay. If you don't, I feel bad for you. It was an awesome show where Wishbone, which is the most adorable Jack Russell Terrier. Outside of Frasier. Well, I didn't watch that show, but. Neither did I, but I know there was a Jack Russell Terrier. And I know because there was a Jack Russell Terrier on Frasier, a bunch of people got Jack Russell Terriers expecting them to be well-behaved and trainable. And they you know. were quickly disappointed. Yeah, no. No, absolutely not. Only Hollywood Jack Russells are well, yeah, very, very have, easily they trained. They have the training. Yeah, exactly. And more importantly, uh, the trainers have the training. Yes. So Wishbone puts himself into the roles of classic book characters and goes on adventures. Mm-hmm. It was a truly great show because it wasn't dumbed down for kids the way that shows are now. Like if there was it was a sad, little simplified, but yeah. But if there was something sad or unpleasant, they showed it. Like mm-hmm. they didn't shy away from showing the unpleasant, sad thing that happened because it was a classic book. Yeah, and likewise, you know, Wishbone was involved in the lives of was it three kids or something? Yeah, there was, there was a couple a, of there, kids. There were a few. There were a few kids. Yeah, there was Samantha. I, was one of I them. don't remember a whole lot. But I did put a link to the YouTube page with a bunch of videos of Wishbone Mm -hmm. on the website so you can Mm. check it out. Oh, and Wishbone was played by a dog named Soccer and was voiced by Larry Brantley. He hasn't really done a whole bunch of stuff. I didn't bother looking him up. I can still recognize his voice when I hear it. Yep. And then we have a little emotion break because Soccer, the dog, died at the age of 13 back in Mm. 2001. Sad face. Sad face. Yeah. I actually had a little emotion break in my notes because... Puppies. Yeah. Dogs dying is sad. So, the tour guide says that 28 inmates died at Alcatraz, 9 by attempting escape, and 4 by execution. Now, here's the problem. I don't really want a tangent again so soon, but this has to be said. No one was executed at Alcatraz. Anyone who was serving a death sentence was transferred to San Quentin for execution in the gas chamber. Yes, 28 people did die there, but eight were murdered by other inmates, five committed suicide, and 15 died from natural causes. That's just what they want you to think. Anyway. (laughs) So, the tour guide tells the group about the ghost of Alcatraz, who's supposedly in the cell that they are standing in front of. And he jokes about seeing if the ghost is in... He opens the cell, he goes inside, and closes the door behind him and tells the group to listen closely and they can hear the ghost cry. Which turns out to be the wind Mm -hmm. for most people. And then Jackson Jackson. calls the park ranger an idiot, at which point Phoebe's head pops up because she was busy, like, reading the pamphlet or whatever. Yeah, she was looking down at the map of Alcatraz. And her head pops up and she sees 
There is indeed a dude in the cell uh-huh. with the and Black Ranger. she also sees the Black Robe Lady. I wasn't sure that she could see the Black Robe Lady. Yeah. Like, it seemed kind of ambiguous. Well, because like, later Like, she could on, definitely see Jackson, but she couldn't always see the Black Robe. That was the impression I got, at least. Well, because later on, there is a mention of both of them being seen. But yeah, so Phoebe, who is distracted looking at the pamphlet, looks up because she hears him talking. And Black Robe Lady <laughs> tells Jackson... To see the tour guide as his get out of jail free card, and then so she, she like does, does something, something with her hand, and the tour yeah. guide just drops, drops dead. dead. Yeah, and a woman cries out, "Oh my god!" And that turns out to be Phoebe's friend Marianne. So it's like, give that lady a sad card. In my notes, it's like she's been given a name and a line. I fear for her, but no, I don't. I don't. Count I don't because she only most, had the that's one. That's a throwaway line. line. Yeah, she only had the one line, so all is good, right, Blue? Yes. Thank you for kisses. Phoebe tells her to call 911 and then goes up to the cell and asks who they are. And Jackson is surprised that she can see him. Black Robe Lady tells him to forget about her and get into the dead guy, which is, you know. <laughs> so he just kind I'm of. I'm paraphrasing, but it was funny. Like, Phoebe realizes what that means and she kind of stopped and she's like, oh, you yeah, better you don't. not. But, so she's looking like a crazy person to all the people around her because oh, she's yeah. yelling at Jackson not to do it. But then, of course, he does. He gets in the dead guy. And <laughs> Black Robe Lady is like, hope you enjoyed the tour. See ya. And then she disappears into like a puff of fire. And Phoebe has like a momentary freak out. And then we go to the opening credits. Oh. The post credits song on DVD was called Stolen Car by Beth Orton. She is an English artist whose music genre is called Folktronica. Which is brilliant. What? It's folk and electronica put together. That's great. It was kind of awesome. She's had a bunch of songs. That's a sweet portmanteau there. Sweet portmanteau. Sweet portmanteau. She's had songs in a bunch of shows like Felicity, Dawson's Creek, Grey's Anatomy, like a whole bunch of stuff. She's still doing stuff today. Netflix had a song called Raining by Kim Devine. The song wasn't jarring and it didn't feel out of place, but I couldn't find a whole lot of interesting stuff on her. She's out there making music, so that's kind of cool. Soundhound had failed me, but Shazam came through. Hashtag not sponsored. Hashtag not sponsored. Then we get a flying shot coming at Alcatraz Island, soaring over the water. And we see the tour guide's body being zipped up in a body bag. And Phoebe getting questioned by some police who aren't Andy and Daryl. (laughs) <laughs> it was a female police officer. Well, they were probably through the Federal Park Service or something. Yeah. But we don't get any dialogue. It's just a quick scene. And then we go to an exterior shot of Buckland's where we see brown suit lady walking with red umbrella lady as umbrella with briefcase guy walks behind and we get a glimpse of feathers in her hair lady. <laughs> so everyone's in the office. Yeah. Today. It's it's a good shot, that one. So Prue and Claire are in Claire's office. Claire is in a red suit jacket with a gold brooch on the collar and a black skirt. She's telling Prue that she's the reason, meaning Prue, is the reason that the auction house isn't bankrupt. Prue thanks her, but Claire gets down to business and tells Prue that all of the family emergencies she's having have been taking her away from the work and it's got to stop because buyers are interested in purchasing Bucklands and they're visiting in the next two days and tells Prue that she has to make a big impression on them if she expects to keep her job. And then Prue's assistant opens the door to tell Prue that her sister's on the phone with an emergency. So, of course, Prue goes to answer the phone. Cut to Phoebe in the manor, sitting at the cafe table. Phoebe asks her about the ghost of Alcatraz, and Prue is annoyed because she does not deem this as an emergency. (laughs) Kind of rightfully so. You know. (laughs) Phoebe tells Prue that she thinks that the ghost really exists, and Prue asks if Phoebe saw the ghost, and Phoebe's all like, No, of course not. How could I? Because she was supposed to get errands done instead of hanging out at Alcatraz. Which she, of course, didn't do. Mm -hmm. Prue asks why she thinks the ghost is real. And Phoebe says that her friend Marianne saw the ghosts. And, well, she thinks she may have seen two ghosts, but one may have been something else. Which is why I said that Phoebe saw both of them. Prue starts to be annoyed with her again, and Phoebe tells her that witches aren't the only people who can see ghosts, you know. She goes on to say something about the research that she's done, and we see Claire impatiently waiting in the doorway for Prue. Prue notices Claire, says into the phone, you know, something about the furnace exploding, then whispers to not forget to buy tampons, and hangs up, which I thought was hilarious. Prue then turns to Claire and has the best moment where she's like, just, uh, (sighs) singed eyebrows. It was great. Like, the exploding noise, everything. It was just hilarious. 
We then get an exterior street shot of the police station. And we see Andy, who is wearing a drab brown suit with a gray shirt. The drabbest. Uh-huh. And a brown tie with a square pattern. Jeez, how 80s can he be? Yeah. Mm. Daryl has on black pants with a striking blue button-down shirt and a tie with a small diamond pattern. It looks very nice on him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Daryl's always the more fashionable of the two. He really is. Daryl asks Andy if he took some old case files home with him because they're missing a few. And he then asks why Andy's been such a zombie since meeting up with Prue again. Because he started watching Walking Dead. (laughs) That that didn't exist yet. 15 years early. (laughs) Yeah, didn't exist yet. When a woman walks in wearing a blue dress suit with a white collared shirt that's open wide. And the jacket had an interesting closure on the side. It wasn't a button. It was more like a latch. Hmm. Picture up on the website. We aren't told her name, but she says that they are experts on the freaky cases and ask them to figure out the case that she's been working on. She tells them about the victim's wounds and then shows them a photo of the knife with a print that didn't come from dusting. It apparently came from fluoroscoping. Mm Mm-hmm. Which, why would you be doing that to a knife? Yeah, I want to know why they decided to do that. Yeah. Because that's an x-ray technique. Like, that's not... mm, Yeah. Whatever. So, we don't know why they fluoroscoped the knife, but they did. Daryl says that he's never heard of an ultraviolet fingerprint... And she says they ran the print and it matched Jackson Ward, who was the last inmate to die at Alcatraz via execution. Apparently. Uh Uh-huh. Though that never happened. But she's sure that it was his print because she checked it twice. So she should work for Santa. Yes. I knew you were going to make that joke. Daryl thinks it has to be a mistake. And Andy asks to borrow the picture. He takes it and goes to leave. And the woman asks where he's going. And then we cut to an exterior night shot of the Hollywood Manor. Because can't stay in one place too long. Nope. Prue walks into the kitchen. She's now got a cool leather jacket over her outfit. Oh, I didn't go back and look in the fridge. <laughs> you like my little note? <laughs> Insert fridge stuff here. Yep. Because fridge is basically empty. There's a bunch of dirty dishes in the sink. Phoebe has clearly done a jack shit with the house. Yeah. The fridge is nearly empty. I think there was like... A can of 7-Up in there and, like, a bottle of mustard. It was Like, there was nothing in there. hmm She calls out for Phoebe. She sees all the dirty dishes in the sink, looks in the fridge, sees the emptiness of the fridge. Which reflects the emptiness of her soul. Okay. Sure. They then have a terse conversation about Phoebe not running the errand. She said she would, but Phoebe thought the ghost thing seemed more important. Phoebe doesn't want to get into a fight with Prue because it would just prove Piper right. And then the doorbell rings. Prue answers it, and it's Andy. Saved by the bell again. Yep. Prue answers the door, and it's Andy. And they have a quick, you know, are you still dealing with me being witch kind of conversation before he says that he's there on a case that before knowing their secret, he would have searched for a logical explanation. But now that he knows, he's like, fuck logic. Yeah, exactly. If I see something weird, I'm bringing it to the girls. Exactly. So they go inside, and he tells her of the victim, and he mentions the only quote-unquote evidence, he actually says, quote-unquote. Yeah. Points to the last man executed on Alcatraz. Phoebe calls out Jackson Ward from the other room, which she knows because she was doing all that research yep. stuff. And his all name, that research. Yeah. And his name was at the top of the list of the people who could be the ghost. She walks out to join them and notices the picture of the knife and asks about it. And he tells her that it's an ultraviolet fingerprint, which shouldn't exist. And Phoebe's like... Oh, that's probably the ghost ectoplasm. It's like skin. Yeah. And it's outside the visual spectrum. Yeah. She then asks to see a picture of Ward, and he shows her one, and she's like, oh, yeah, that's him. And And Bruce's like, what? And she's like, oh, that's that's, that's how how Marion described him to me. Yeah, it was kind of funny. We learn that the victim was the son of the prosecutor who convicted Jackson, and that Andy doesn't know if he's ready to deal with ghosts, because he's just getting used to the idea of demons and witches. But if the killer is a ghost, he wants to know how to stop him from killing again. Which, you know, is good logic there. Right, Blue? Thank you. Thank you for Chris's. So we get to an exterior night shot of a big white building with a bunch of pillars. Gee, I wonder what it's... Oh, it's it's probably a courthouse, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Then we show up in Judge Renault's office. And we know this because of the nameplate on his desk. Uh-huh. As you do. Uh-huh. He's an older gentleman 
He's wearing black pants, a white button-down shirt, a black vest, and a tie with a diamond pattern. The actor is Jack Donner. He was born in 1928, and he's still alive and kicking. Oh, yeah. He's been in a ton of stuff, including an episode of Buffy and a bunch of General Hospital episodes. Mm -hmm. And he's in the movie Unbelievable! With five exclamation points with the black world woman. So there's that. Oh, man. That's yep. funny. Yep. Thought that was kind of funny. Why does it need five exclamation points? It's a stupid comedy typey thing. Gilbert Gottfried is in it. Like, it's a... Yeah. I, oh, apparently he was also in the original Star Trek. Yeah. Yeah. I think he was a Romulan. I know not. Strangely, he's got fewer acting credits than the guy who plays Jackson. Mm-hmm. Oof. Exactly. Oh, he's in Con Man. Mm, yeah, I haven't seen that yet. I want Either to, but I haven't seen it. I, I played the iPad game, though. He was in Wizards of Waverly Place movie. Yes. Go back go back up and go to Unbelievable with five exclamation points and you will understand why I say. Oh, oh it's from those people. Yeah. Man. Oh, Marina Sirtis. Yeah, there's a bunch of people in it. Oh, and Michael Dorn and Michelle Nichols. Mm-hmm. Yay. I'll just start Armin. Armin. And John, oh, because they were getting a bunch of the Star Trek people together. Okay. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Yep, yep. Okay. So Jackson literally walks through the door, like doesn't open it, just walks straight on through it. Mm -hmm. You know, ghost. Yeah. And then he turns off the light in the room and the judge seems unfazed by this and just turns his desk lamp on. Like, you know, the lights go out all the time. Yeah. What happened? I don't know. It is a thing. Yeah. Jackson taunts him, but the judge can't hear him. And then he picks up the nameplate, which freaks the judge out. And Jackson pulls on his tie so it chokes him a bit. And then he yells at him about how horrible it is to die in the gas chamber and then grabs a letter opener and stabs the judge. Black robe woman appears, saying that but she will help him get his revenge. But of course, he's just getting started. Mm -hmm. And, and continues, continues to stab the judge. Because he's got an M.O. and, well, he will be damned if he doesn't do it. Exactly. And then we go to commercial break. When we come back from commercial, we get an exterior daytime shot of the same white building from slightly farther away. And in the judge's office, all of the police are there. Every single one of them. Mm -hmm. Which means Andy and Daryl. <laughs> but there are a bunch of others, too. It's the next day, so there are new outfits. Andy is wearing gray slacks with his black suit jacket, a white shirt and blue tie with a triangle pattern. Daryl is in a gray suit with a red shirt and a red patterned tie. Mm. It's kind of nice. We learn that the wounds are the same as the other victim, which matches Jackson's M.O. So Daryl thinks that it must be a copycat killer, but Andy says the M.O. was never released to the public. Because that's always how you know. Exactly. And then he asks to see the letter opener, which has already been dusted for prints, and nothing was found. So he asks if it was fluoroscoped, and then shines a blue light above it, and the a. ultraviolet yeah. fingerprint shows up. So, first of all... That's not fluoroscoping. Yeah, no, that's sticking a UV light, like a black light, on it. Mm -hmm. But fluoroscoping is an x-ray technique, so that shouldn't work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, you know, a la convenience and such. And he then bets Daryl ten bucks that it matches Jackson Ward, and Daryl reminds him that Jackson Ward is dead and has been for some time. But Andy says someone's going around killing people, or at least the descendants of people, who put Jackson Ward away... And he grabs his coat and bag and starts to leave. Daryl, of course, asks where he's going, but Andy tells Daryl to have someone put together a list of potential victims. And he leaves. Daryl tries calling after him, but, you know, yeah, he's not having it. Nope. Cut over to an exterior shot of Buckland's. It's a lower, wider shot than we normally get. An umbrella briefcase guy is walking by. Yeah. <laughs> Inside... We have, some, we have some Asian clients uh -huh. who are waiting and looking at their watches because, oh yeah, y'all know Prue's late. Yeah. And Claire is trying to stall for time. Because saying, she's there. Yeah. Saying Prue has a lot, a lot of, of family, family emergencies. emergencies. Yeah. Prue enters the room apologizing. She is now wearing a white sleeveless turtleneck shirt that's uh -huh. just a little too short. And no bra. Yeah. And khaki pants that look vaguely suede. Mm, khaki pants. Yes. Khaki pants. Claire introduces her to... Mr. Yakihama, the head of acquisitions, and she calls Prue one of their top specialists. 
Now, I'm not going on a tangent, but the actor playing Yakihama is named Yuji Hasegawa. This was his very first role, but just after this, he was in a movie called Brother, where his IMDb credit is Whorehouse Customer. And I just thought you should know that. <laughs> what? I just thought it was auction funny. House, auction House Client to Whorehouse Customer. Yeah. Oh, How the Mighty Have Fallen? Yeah, I just thought it was very funny, and I thought you should know it. They exchange hellos. He asks if her family is okay, because, you know... Then her assistant enters with Andy behind her, and he pulls her out of the meeting for police business. They walk outside the room, and she immediately asks if he's trying to get her fired. And he tells her that Jackson Ward is killed again, and she's annoyed, but she knows that she has to help. So she walks back into the room, and then we jump in time via quick exterior shot of the second floor of the Halliwell Manor. Phoebe is in the attic, looking through the Book of Shadows. She is now wearing a cropped orange zip-up hoodie with lovely front pockets and black pants. Prue yells for her from downstairs and then enters the attic with Andy behind her, who says he's always wondered what was in the attic. Yeah, apparently this, like, crosses Phoebe's boundary, and she's like, but why is Andy up? It's like Andy's walked into her bedroom. Yeah, but she's freaking out because of the Book of Shadows, but she called- Shadababos. Shadababos, which was the funniest fucking thing ever. Like, she's trying to hide b- the Book of Shadow the Bows. That's, yeah, like, that's, that's like the... That's, how, that's the best way to be the like... The tutorial uh, that the guy who plays Porky Pig did, yeah. where he explained, like, how he does the voice, yep. and he does it really, really slow, and then he does it fast, and he's like, and that's why I have job security, because no one can fucking do that. Exactly. So she tries to hide the Book of Shadow the Bows, but Prue has already told Andy about it. She tells Phoebe that Jackson Ward has killed again, and they have to figure out a way to stop him. And after a bit of back and forth... Phoebe says that there's one spell from the book, but she doesn't think they're going to want to use it because an evil spirit can't be vanquished on the physical plane. It can only be vanquished from the astral plane, which means that one of them would have to die for the spell to actually work. Oh, gee. Prue tells her to keep looking. Andy says that he could never have imagined that stuff like this existed, and Prue says that they couldn't either, but there's probably a very good reason why they were all exposed to it. Then the Book of Shadows starts flipping pages, which freaks Andy out a bit, but Prue's like, oh, it does that sometimes, which I thought was kind of funny. It opens to the truth spell. Andy looks at it and asks about it. And then Prue and Phoebe have a back and forth with sisterly arguing about why the book would open to that page while Andy was there. Sadly, where, with no more shababados. Nope. Where Prue turns to a different page in the book, and then Phoebe turns it back. And then we jump to a little while later... As Prue and Andy are going down the stairs, and they're arguing because now he knows that she used that spell on him, and he wants to know if his reaction to her being a witch was the reason they stopped seeing each other, which, after a bit of back and forth, Prue says that it was. And Andy wonders, just out of curiosity, how much time she gave him to react to the news. She finally relents that it was only a minute or two because it was a 24-hour spell and she was against the clock. Andy, rightfully, just as I said when we did that episode, Mm -hmm. is pissed off because he's had a week to react to it this time, but he still doesn't know how he feels. Phoebe comes down the stairs saying something about stopping Jackson from killing his next victim, and then she asks if she's interrupting something. Andy says that they're done, but asks how they can stop Jackson. Phoebe, pouting a bit, says, I have a power too, you know, which was kind of funny. Pay attention to me! Uh Uh-huh. Then we get... An exterior night street shot of the police station. Andy walks into the evidence storage warehouse. He has a tan trench coat over his suit now. So he's clearly ready to flash someone. (laughs) No. He asks the desk officer for the murder weapon for case R-13658. Gets the item and leaves. And the desk officer immediately picks up the phone to call someone and says something about, you wanted to know if Trudeau showed up. Yeah. He just oh, well, left. he did. Yeah, he just left. And then we cut to the office. So now he has, what is it, the letter opener, right? That's the, the weapon? Yeah, he's got the letter no, opener. No, I, I thought he, no, I thought he had a knife or something. No, the knife was the first weapon. Letter opener was the second. Okay. Because he's getting the second, the second okay. weapon. Okay, I, I don't know why in remembering this I thought it was something from the original case. No. So then we cut to the office. Andy asks Joe for the list of potential victims, which is a lot of names. Oh, yeah. And takes what he's got so far. He goes to leave, and Daryl tries to get him to stay because they're partners. Andy says that he knows that, but he needs to do this alone right now. 
And he leaves, and a man wearing a black suit, white shirt, and blue tie, standing next to a man in a brownish-gray suit, white shirt, and diagonal striped tie, walk in. So, a couple of suits. Uh Uh-huh. The black suit dude is Inspector Rodriguez, and brownish-gray suit is Inspector Anderson. And they're from Internal Affairs. They want to talk to Daryl about Andy. Anderson is played by Don Brunner. He's been in a bunch of stuff, but hasn't done anything in the past decade. Mm-hmm. He was born in Oakley, Illinois, which is somewhere in the middle of the state, northeast of Springfield. That's about the most interesting thing that I cared about. <laughs> Rodriguez, however, is played by Carlos Gomez, who has done a ton of stuff. He's been in fucking everything. Yeah, including a stint as a paramedic on ER. He was Madam- almost certainly on Criminal Minds. Possibly. Right now he's on Madam Secretary, but I know him from a little show called The Glades. Which was canceled on a cliffhanger, and I'm still salty about it. Oh, that was the one set in Florida, right? Yep. Still salty about the canceling of that show. Much like the water. Yes, indeed. So, then we cut to the car, where Andy gets in, and Prue and Phoebe are waiting for him. He hands Phoebe the letter opener, and wonders how her power works. She says that she's been practicing calling her power, and if the psychic energy is strong enough, she should be able to see a future event. Should, being the operative word. Yeah, because it doesn't always work, but as she holds the letter opener, she has a premonition where she not only sees an old woman's death, but she also feels the pain and terror she was feeling. Ugh, so, yeah, so that's some strong psychic juju. Uh Uh-huh. Andy hands her some pictures and asks if anyone looks familiar. She kind of flips through them and picks one out, and this is apparently a woman named Iris Biederman, Mm -hmm. a very old woman who was the four-person on the jury that convicted Jackson. Mm -hmm. I find it very interesting that they basically used her headshot or something, or, like, a photo they took of her that day, like, when she was on set. Yeah. because I'm assuming it was supposed to be, like, her driver's license photo or something. I mean, if it was part of the old case files, I don't know why they would necessarily have an updated photo. Yeah, no, but that's what I'm saying, is I think that it was possibly supposed to be, like, her driver's license photo or something. Okay. Because it's the only thing that makes sense as to why it was an old woman. Which... Lady that old probably doesn't have a valid driver's license anymore. Not necessarily. What's the senior discount? 65? I know and after someone... that, you need testing every year? Every I year, yeah. I think. But I know someone who was 86 and still driving. Oh, yeah. My grandma was driving up until she was 91, and we're like, sweetie, you need to stop. <laughs> and we, that was the year we moved her into the nursing home. Yeah. Then we go to an exterior night shot of a very large house on a corner. And my very first thought was, that's a good looking house for an old lady. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, jury four people make super moolah, right? Yeah, that's not how that works, but all right. We see the woman from Phoebe's Premonition. She is wearing a green shirt with a subtle flower pattern on it and what looks like a light blue terry cloth sweater. Slightly odd. Jackson is about to stab her when Andy kicks the door open. And sees a chef's knife floating in the air. Mm Mm-hmm. Phoebe kicks the knife out of Jackson's hand. Oh, and Prue has added a white jacket to her outfit, and Phoebe has added a tan leather jacket to hers. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, gotta keep up with the outfits. Jackson recognizes Phoebe, which makes Prue question her. Yeah. Which is kind of funny. Like, do you two know each other? It was a cute little moment. But she brushes it off, and Andy asks where Jackson is. Prue points him out, but Andy can't see him. And Andy's, like, holding his gun at the air like that's going to do anything. Like, yeah, what a Like, where'd he go? I want to shoot him. It's, yeah. you know, Andy, cop, gun. Exactly. Huh. Jackson says that they can't keep saving her forever, or the others, or themselves. And then he leaves through the wall while laughing, and we go to commercial break. When we come back from commercial, we now are in an exterior night shot of the Halliwell Manor. Prue and Phoebe walk through the front door, and Prue is upset because Phoebe lied to her, and she had to hear about it from a ghost, Mm -hmm. and she doesn't understand why she couldn't just tell her the truth. And you get some spectacular visible nip through this sweater at this point. Oh, yeah. It's quite nice. And Phoebe says that she thought she'd save herself the drama, and they go back and forth a bit about why Prue is really mad at Phoebe, and it finally comes out after Phoebe brings up the conversation that had happened as Piper was leaving. That Prue is annoyed because Phoebe doesn't have a real job, and that's why Phoebe lied to her. And then the phone rings, and it's Piper calling from Hawaii. 
Aw. Mm-hmm. And Phoebe's the only one who talks to her and asks her how she's doing. Piper apparently hasn't stopped working since she got there, which is funny because <laughs> we see her sitting in, like, one of those wicker wingback chairs. Yep. And she's got a lay on. Yep. Her hair is down. Mm-hmm. She's wearing a white shirt that has sleeves to her elbows and jeans. Is that her normal work shirt? I think it might be. Yeah. Yeah. But jeans instead of black pants. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not going to change it, but did you know there's over eight different methods to making a lay? I didn't, but it doesn't surprise me. Yeah. I put a link to the wiki page for it on the website so you can read about it. So, when Piper says that she hasn't stopped working since she got off the plane, Phoebe is just like, sure, rub it in, which was a very funny line It in was kind of under her breath, too, so if Piper doesn't really register it. Yeah, it was a cute line in that moment. Mm-hmm. Piper was just calling to check in on them, because she wanted to make sure they weren't at each other's throats. Yeah. And they exchange I love yous and goodbyes, and then they hang up. And as we get a last view of Piper, she's grabbing a drink from the table that looks like a coconut carved into the shape of a little person. And she, she picks it up and she goes, mmm. Yeah. And she, was, like, she made the cutest face of like, I get a coconut drink, la 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 we la need la. a picture of that up on the website. Oh, yeah. There will be pictures on the website. Mm-hmm. Let me go back to the girls at the house. And Prue asked Phoebe... Why didn't you tell her about Jackson? And Phoebe said like, there was I didn't no want to reason. Worry her. Yeah, there was no reason to worry her well, because she how's can't she gonna do get anything. back here. Like, yeah, Prue realizes that they have some issues to deal with that aren't going to be resolved overnight. So they need to figure out a way to stop Jackson before he hurts anyone else. Phoebe agrees, and Prue asks if they just reached a compromise. So which, Phoebe rolls her eyes. Yeah, it was they got she got a good eye roll. It was quite nice. Got to an exterior night shot of the police station. Uh huh. Andy and. Little old four lady. Mm-hmm. Iris Biederman is there. Yep. Andy says that they're putting her up in a hotel under police protection until they catch whoever's trying to hurt her. And it sounds very official that he's like being all like, this mm-hmm. is normal. And Iris looks at him and she's like, I'm not crazy. You saw it too, right? Yeah. And he kind of like lowers the voice and is like, yes, I did. But let's keep it our little secret for yeah. now. Which, Yeah. That's the great thing to tell an old lady. Hey, that floating knife that was trying to kill you, just our little secret. Yeah, totally. But she nods and walks away as Daryl walks in and asks who she was, and Andy tells him that she got attacked, and Daryl starts questioning him as he sees the sheet of paper with her information on it on the desk that Andy tried to hide as he walked up. Mm-hmm. Andy, of course, tries to deflect, and after a bit of runaround, Andy finally learns that Internal Affairs is after him, Daryl tells him to watch his back, and, and we, we jump, jump to, to the, the kitchen. kitchen. Yep, no exterior shot, just back at the manor. Mm-hmm. Phoebe and Prue are going through the Book of Shadows again, still trying to figure out, you know, a way to vanquish this ephemeral asshole. Yep. Phoebe thinks that there's something in the Book of Shadows about a potion to lure evil spirits, and she turns to the page and reads it out loud. It involves mixing mercury and acid with blood and pouring it over a grave, which Phoebe thinks is disgusting, but Prue is more practical. She says they can get the blood from the letter opener, but trying to figure out where the grave is, Phoebe says... You ain't going to get much blood from that letter opener. No, but trying to figure out where the grave is, Phoebe says she found out on the web. I love that. (laughs) Still funny. That his ashes were interred at the family mausoleum in Palo Alto? Uh Uh-huh. And so they decide to go ahead with the plan, and we cut to an exterior night shot of a cemetery with a mausoleum in the background, and it is the jankiest looking cemetery I have ever seen. And I have seen a lot of cemeteries in my day. Because of your mom? Yeah, my mom does genealogy, and oh, right, yeah. so when I was a kid, we would go cemetery hopping. We'd literally go from cemetery to cemetery trying to find dead relatives. And so there is a picture somewhere... I tried to find it to put it on the website, couldn't find it. But there's a picture somewhere of me hugging a headstone. Aww. Because that was that was my childhood, was, you know, hopping around. But there's a funny story where apparently I was picking flowers from a grave and they had to stop me. Oh. Because, like, no, no, don't don't pick those. Those aren't to be picked. Because I was, you know. They you were, were little. Pretty, yeah, they were pretty. Fl- I was, like, six or something. Like, I was tiny. Yeah. So I understood that it wasn't the smartest thing to do, but they were pretty and I wanted them. But yeah. Anyway, Prue and Phoebe are inside the mausoleum and they joke about hating cemeteries at both night and day, which I don't find cemeteries to be frightening at all. Mm -hmm. And I especially don't find mausoleums to be frightening. Yeah. At night, mausoleums are a little more frightening only because you're inside a building and you don't know who's around. But Mm -hmm. a cemetery... Also, I'm pretty sure we see this mausoleum more times in this show. But yeah, so then Phoebe freaks out at a noise and is like, what was that? 
And Pris jokingly says it was probably a zombie or a vampire. And Phoebe asks, where's Buffy when you need her? Which was especially funny since Jeff Colbert was on Buffy. Yeah. It was cute. And this this would have been right when Buffy was starting to get popular. Mm-hmm. Or probably a little before, I think. Well, no, because Buffy started in 96, so Buffy had been around for a while. No, it was filmed in 96. I don't think it was released until 97, was it? Hold, please. Hold, please. I remember, like, the first couple episodes, like, that episode where she was trying to be a cheerleader. Yeah, 97. Yeah, you're right. Ha! You're right. March of 97. But yeah, even though Buffy started in 97, it was still around for a couple years by this point. So it was pretty popular. Anyway, they find Jackson's grave, and Prue asks for a picture from Phoebe, and she hands her a Polaroid picture where she has written, Hey Jackson, let's party! Which is apparently the only thing she can think of to write, which kind of makes me laugh. Because, you know, <laughs> yeah. Prue then throws the potion on the name plaque, and it starts to melt, and they leave. And the photo, the photo that they put up is great. Yeah. Like, they're both, like, holding the thumbs up or yeah. whatever. It's cute. Yeah. Again, pictures on the website. Uh-huh. Because, yeah. Then we cut to an old man opening the door of a transportation truck as Jackson walks up behind him. But, you know, old man is oblivious because ghost. But then Jackson cries out in pain, and we cut back and forth between him crying out in pain and and the bubbling letters on the grave. Mm -hmm. And then he opens his shirt, and he looks at his chest, and we see his skin is burning and melting and bubbling, and it looks like a science experiment gone wrong. Mm -hmm. And the woman in the black robe dress appears, and Jackson asks what's happening, and she has the best reply. Witchcraft. Sucks, doesn't it? It was great. She tells him that he should have helped her get them before, and to help her now, he needs to visit his grave. Then we cut to Andy at his desk. He pulls out Prue's file and puts a page about black magic and witchcraft into it before putting the file into his bag. However, he's put that page in that file before. That was one of the pages he put in when we first saw this file back in episode 116. So he's probably been playing with it a lot lately. Yeah. He grabs his bag, goes outside and is walking out the door and down the steps, calling their house. He gets their answering machine and leaves a message, and by the time he gets to the end of the stairs, the internal affairs guys are there, and they get him to go with them. And I wonder how much of that phone conversation they heard. Mm Mm-hmm. And then we go to commercial break, because it's been a while, and I think this is the last commercial break. And when we come back, we are in some random room in the police station where the IA guys are grilling Andy about his unsolved cases, wondering why they haven't been solved and wanting to know what he's hiding. And Andy says that he's not hiding anything and notices that one of the IA guys is leaning on his briefcase, which has that huge file about Prue in it. And he's very subtly being totally uncomfortable about that. Uh Uh-huh. They show him a surveillance picture of him getting the letter opener and ask why he checked it out. And he says that he was following a hunch. And And Rodriguez... Were you following a hunch? Or a ghost. ghost. Yeah. He says that Inspector Blakely says they specialize in the freaky cases. So now we have a name for the woman with the blue jacket with the interesting closure on it from earlier. Inspector Rodriguez says that Andy's a good cop. And we learn that until last year, he was headed for Captain. But now he has a bunch of weird unsolved cases. So apparently Captain is no longer in the cards. Which, you know, that's not how things work. But okay. He wants to know if Andy is covering for someone like Daryl, but Andy gets defensive and then he stands up and is nearly yelling at them that if they don't believe him, they can take his badge and gun and charge him. And then tells him to drop dead. Yeah. Because he's a teenage girl. Yeah. And then grabs grabs his bag and storms storms out out of the the room. room. Because he's a teenage girl. Yeah. Yeah. Then we cut to an exterior daytime shot of the Halliwell Manor and we see Phoebe and Prue in the kitchen. Phoebe is in black pinstripe pants and a short sleeve teal shirt with no bra, because we can see her nipples. Mm-hmm. Prue is wearing jeans, and how do I explain this shirt? It's a gray hoodie that buttons at the neck, the boobs, and the stomach. That's it. Three buttons. It shows her belly button, so we know she's not wearing a bra or any other shirt underneath it, even though she probably should, but at least she's not wearing that shirt to work. Mm-hmm. So that's good, but it only had three buttons, and you can completely see her skin underneath it. Yep. Yeah. In the kitchen, Prue's making a potion that will make the heart stop immediately. Phoebe asks where she learned it, and Prue says it was in the Book of Shadows. Phoebe asks, where? Under Dr. Kevorkian? 
Yeah. Which was hilarious. It was a very funny line. And, and yeah, it'd be, it'd be even funnier if it were in the Book of Shadows, because Kevorkian's is entirely scientific. Yeah. But Priya says, whoever takes the potion can be revived by CPR, but it has to be done within four minutes to avoid brain damage. Phoebe wants to know which one of them's going to drink it, and Prue volunteers, but Phoebe says they'll decide with the flip of a coin. She also tells Prue not to use her power, which mm. kind of made me laugh. Yeah. Prue calls Tails, and that's what the coin lands on. And they have a bit of back and forth before Phoebe wishes Piper was there to be a swing vote. Mm-hmm. It was a it was a really sincere moment from Phoebe. Mm-hmm. And Prue's like, oh yeah, I've been taking you for granted. Yep, she finally realizes. Because, you know, she just goes and deals with work, and she completely takes Phoebe for granted that she'll just be there to take care of the house. Yep, absolutely. Prue was upset because she thought that Phoebe was slacking off when she was actually trying to find out who the ghost was. And Phoebe comes to realize that she wants a real job. Yeah. They have a little cathartic hug and then the phone rings. Prue answers it and it's Claire who tells her that she's late and she's fired. Oh no. Oh crap. But she can't deal with that right now because Jackson walks through the wall, smashes something and throws it at them. Oh yeah. Prue Prue tells Phoebe to duck, and surprisingly, a duck doesn't appear. (laughs) That was the other episode. Then she drinks the cocktail while Phoebe attempts to fight Jackson. Uh Uh-huh. They did this very well choreographically. Like, they didn't have Phoebe touching Jackson. She was just grabbing whatever he was holding. Yep. It was was uh, nicely choreographed, And, of course, the consequence of him being an ephemeral asshole, he can, you know, let go of the shit he's holding and grab something else and knock Phoebe over the head, which is what he does. Yep, he knocks her out. And she collapses to the floor. And then Prue collapses to the floor. Yep. Jackson then finds a metal cake server. From the hutch next to the kitchen table. Yeah. And Prue's spirit floats out of her body. But it's kind of like tethered to her body. It's just kind of... Yeah. She, she kind of looks like a genie. Yeah, a little. Yeah, with a like the, the smoky tail. A little bit. And then she starts saying the spell to vanquish him, which is ashes to ashes, spirit to spirit, take his soul, banish this evil. Not a rhyme at all in no. there. No. Not at all. Jackson starts screaming. And we cut to the door where Andy is opening it and calling for Prue. Yeah. And just by chance, he happens to see, because where Phoebe collapsed, she's in that little hallway from the dining room into the kitchen. So her like head and her arm is visible from the front door. Yep. He sees it and runs, runs over. on in. Yeah, runs over to her, checks for a pulse. Seeing that she still has a pulse, he kind of just leaves her there. Prue then says the spell for the second time, and Jackson starts fading away, still screaming. Mm -hmm. And then Andy goes into the kitchen and sees Prue on the floor, and he starts giving her CPR, and she's trying to stop him because, not yet, he doesn't hear her, of course. And Jackson seems excited because Prue has stopped saying the spell. And he's he's like, oh, all of a sudden better. I I get to kill a cop now. Yeah. He's super stoked. Yeah. He starts to fling the cake server at Andy. Prue yells out, watch out. And this time he somehow seems to hear her. Andy looks behind him, he grabs a towel, and then grabs the cake server. Like, wraps it around the cake server and pulls it out of Jackson's grip. Because, well, he can't see Jackson, he can certainly see See, the weapon. Yeah, yeah, but the funny part is, like, there's no way that he would have had enough time to turn around, then turn back, grab the towel from the table, and then turn around again to grab the cake server before it hit him. Yeah, It was totally a la convenience, Uh but whatever. Prue then says the spell for the third and final time, and Jackson yells and melts and disappears. So you have to wonder, if Prue had just talked faster, everything would have gone faster. Mm -hmm. So instead of telling Andy to stop, she should have just said the spell once more. Uh Uh-huh. Right? Yeah. Stupid writers. Black Robe Woman shows up and grabs the flame that apparently Jackson's soul has transformed into. Yep. And Prue's like, who the hell are you? But the lady doesn't answer. Mm -hmm. She's like, I was just hoping to get your soul... But I know it's safe for now, and because, I'm happy you know, to have Jackson's. Yeah, because she sees Andy performing my CPR question, and my knows. My question, why didn't she show up earlier? I have no she idea. She totally could have. She could have shown up the second that she knew Jackson was going to be there, and just waited for Prue to drink the stuff, and then could have just taken Prue. Yep. Absolutely. And that would have been done. Absolutely. And she but, wouldn't have know, had to, you know, settle for Jackson. A la convenience. Ah, uh, yeah. It is a thing. But so, Black Robe Lady, her little soul collector, disappears, and Prue's spirit enters back into her body, and she wakes up with a cough. And uh-huh. then a, a second later, Phoebe wakes up, sits up, and her hair is like totally disheveled, and she asks if is the, the ghost, ghost is toast. toast. Yeah. Is the ghost toast? It was, it was a cute line. It yeah. was funny. 
And it rhymed more than the spell did. Yes. So there's that. Yes. Ghost is toast. He is uh, khaki toast. Khaki tacos. <laughs> yeah. We get an exterior shot of Bucklands. And it's a slight distance shot. And we see brown suit lady on the left. Feathers in her hair lady in the middle. And tan jacket floral skirt lady on the right. We get all three of them. And mm-hmm. I smile. It's apparently later that day, because Prue has now changed clothes. Mm-hmm. Well, you know. Either she, that or it's the next day, but I'm assuming. Her clothes are dirty after she died in them. Well, it wasn't a very work-appropriate shirt, so I'm glad she changed. Yeah. Yeah. So, Prue and Claire are in Claire's office. Claire is in a brown plaid suit jacket over a black skirt and shirt. Prue is now in a long sleeve black sweater that is only buttoned to her boobs, like up the torso. That has a very subtle dot pattern down the arms and on the bust with a gray, lightly striped skirt. It was kind of nice. It was very, like had it been buttoned just one more button up, it would have been work appropriate. Yep. Yep. Prue is practically begging for her job, but Claire says that she wouldn't tolerate any more unexplained absences. When, a la convenience, Andy kind of barges in. Halfway between a barge and a saunter. But he wasn't announced by the assistant, mm-hmm. so he totally barged he in. He just kind of like happily jaunts on in yep. and thanks Claire for letting him borrow Prue. Yep. And Claire's like, what, what? is this? Yeah. And he says, he makes up some story about an Asian gang smuggling exotic jewelry and antiques and Prue helps them set up a sting to bust the operation. Yeah. And Claire's like, oh, oh well, Prue never, never mentioned, mentioned that. that. And Andy's like... Oh. Well, she couldn't compromise her cover, which was kind of funny. And then he goes, well, you can always call my superior, Inspector Morris, to file a reimbursement claim, which was the best way to do that. Because, like, Uh yes, call this dude. Yeah, he's above me in rank. Totally. Totally. Yeah, but And he will bust your rank. Yeah. But Claire says that it won't be necessary. So it was some good bullshitting from Andy, Mm -hmm. who happens to be wearing a black suit with a dark teal shirt and tie with a weird oval pattern on it. It's a little odd, mm. but not bad. Just odd. So Annie tells Prue that they need to talk when she's done. And Prue says she's more than done. And then they walk toward the door. And Claire reminds Prue about their lunch with the investors so that she won't be late to it. Prue thanks her. And then she and Andy go to her office. Prue thanks Andy for helping her out. And Andy just replies with a, you're welcome. And then he goes on to say that he's been thinking about the truth spell. And no matter how long he thinks about it, it won't change the truth. That he just wants a boring, normal life. Ugh. I find that hard to believe, considering his choice of hair gel. You know, you and his hair gel. Like, someone who does that with their hair thinks they're not boring. But he wants a boring, normal life with a white picket fence and 2.5 kids and, you know... Suddenly see more. <laughs> yeah. 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 He wants to marry Seymour from yes. his little shop of horrors. Absolutely. But Prue says that she understands and says that she would want that too, but she She can't. can't. Then they hug, and we go to an exterior shot of the manor later that day, where Prue and Phoebe are now bringing groceries into the kitchen. Phoebe is now in dark gray pants, a light light gray, gray, low-cut, cami-style shirt that's riding up just enough to show her stomach, and a pink knitted jacket slash sweater thing. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Exactly blue. Apparently, Andy gave Prue the file that he had on her. And told her to burn it. So she did. Yeah. And apparently, he had a lot more information on them than they thought he did. Yeah. But, you know, of course, like, he couldn't really connect all of the dots. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But Phoebe wonders how he hurt her when Prue was a ghost, and Prue doesn't know, which... I don't think he necessarily heard her, Mm -hmm. to be completely honest. I think it might have just been, like, Mm -hmm. cop intuition, Mm -hmm. something coming up behind you. I think it's probably one of those, like, hand-wavy soulmate thingies. Maybe. And then (laughs) Piper. Soulmate. Yeah, I know, right? And then Piper, who has somehow managed to open and shut the front door and walk in with no one hearing her, enters the kitchen. She's in gray pants and a blue shirt with a slightly darker blue striping at the best. It was a cute shirt. Yes. She puts pink lays on each of her sisters, and they all say hi, Mm -hmm. and they're very surprised because she wasn't supposed to be home until tomorrow, Right. but she took an earlier flight because she was worried they were at each other's throats. Yeah. And this feels feels like kind of a similar thing to the Andy thing, like she had a a sisterly intuition Mm -hmm. that something was wrong. Yeah. 
And Prue and, and Phoebe turn to each other and they're like, are you kidding? Totally never. not. No, never. Yeah, it was a cute moment. And then they have a lovely time of grabbing a bunch of stuff off the counter to go put away. And Phoebe pets Piper's head as she leaves. And Piper just gives this adorable little face. Nah. I'm like, okay, everything's fine. And then we go to the end credits. And the episode is over. Now, I know that I've mentioned before that the Wikia gives international titles for the episodes. But normally I don't go into it because it's not as big of a deal. But this one made me laugh. Because for most of the titles for this episode, it was The Power of Two in every Mm. language. But for Italian, it was The Murderer Ghost. (laughs) German, it was One Ghost, Two Sisters. which kind of girls, one cup? Yeah, exactly. And in Hungarian, it was War of Spirits. It was just interesting. And I thought it was very, very interesting that Italian, German, and Hungarian were like... Nope, we can't have the power of two for some reason. That doesn't work in Hungarian. Let's make them completely different things. It was an interesting Mm -hmm. little tidbit. Mm -hmm. And I had to share. So that's that episode done. Yay! So now we're at our ratings portion. Would you like to go first? Sure. Okay. I'm giving it six out of ten Auntie Sharon's. That is the only one I will leave it. No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Yep. It's the only one. Fuck you. It's the only one. It's the only one you're getting. You're a butt. I was originally going to make it ephemeral assholes. I'm like, I think Auntie Sharon would be better. Because <laughs> jokes. Yes. I'm giving it 6 out of 10 settling soul collectors. Because mm-hmm. she's settled for Jackson's soul. Well, you know, it's like um, debt collectors when they have to just pay off your debt. They're like, you actually owe like 15 grand, but I'll settle for less. Mm-hmm. Or whatever. Yeah. So I gave this one a six because it got an extra point because of Jeff Colbert. It would have been a five for me, mostly because no one was executed at Alcatraz and I'm a little mad about it. (laughs) But this one just wasn't one of my favorite episodes, probably because I really like Piper. And since Piper wasn't in it very much, you know, yeah, that's probably my reasoning. But it wasn't a horrible episode because it had Jeff Colbert in it. Yeah. So there's that. But now we're on to the outfits. What was your favorite outfit of the episode? I gotta say, just Piper sitting in that chair in Hawaii with the little coconut. Like, that entire shot. I just love that. That's But that's not an outfit, because that's I'm just, calling you know, it. She had a lay on, she had her shirt. Yeah, but that's just a white shirt and a pair of jeans. Like... She had a lay on, and she was on that chair, and she had a coconut. <sighs> okay, then what would be your second favorite? Sleeveless turtleneck. The white sleeveless turtleneck? Yeah. All right. With no bra. It's weird. Okay. For me, I liked the outfit that Piper comes home in because I liked that shirt. With Phoebe, I like the teal shirt outfit. And for Prue, I liked every single one of her outfits in this episode. But I think I'm going to go for the three-button shirt. If she had worn it to the office, I wouldn't have liked it as much. Mm -hmm. The fact that she only wears it at home in the kitchen, that's why I like that one a lot. Yeah. 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 It's like with a ribbed sweater, like. I mean, the boobs aren't very contained, but they're more contained with something where it's literally like, oh, we're just letting them swing freely Mm -hmm. under this extremely loose three-button shirt. Yeah, it was literally pictures on the website, but it was literally a button at the neck, a button at the boobs, and a button at the stomach that showed off her belly button. Yeah. Like, I want to know if it was just that the shirt didn't fit her or that that was supposed to be what it looked like. But that's us done for another week. Mm-hmm. So now it's social media time. Yay! Yay! We can be found at charmedchats.com. As per usual. And you can email us at charmedchats at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. We have an Instagram. And we a Facebook. We have a Facebook. And, and a Snapchat. Patreon. And, and a Patreon. And a Snapchat. And a Twitter. And a Tumblr. Uh-huh. Well, the Facebook, the Instagram, the Patreon, and the Snapchat are all under Charm Chats. Mm-hmm. The Twitter and as the Tumblr. As is the Pinterest. As is the Pinterest. The Twitter and the Tumblr are under Charm Chats Pod, because for some reason, Charm Chats wasn't available. Well, technically, the, we do have a Tumblr that is Charm Chats, but you run that one. Yeah. And it's just a lot of reblogs of Charmed stuff, mm-hmm. which is nice. But Charm Chats Pod is the one that I run that actually says when the new episode is up. Yeah. I'm also starting to reblog some stuff. Yes. I've started to put up one post a day from something about season one while we're doing season one. Once we get into season two a bit, then I'll start putting up season two stuff. 
But that's it. Mm-hmm. We're done with episode 120. We are so close to the end of the season. Mm-hmm. Now, I'll probably mention it again next week. And since we were off last week, we will be taking a break for Thanksgiving. So there will be no episode on November 27th. There will be one on the 20th, but there will be a week break between episode 121 and 122, which is the season finale. And then there will be a week break, at least a week break, between the season finale and the start of the new season. Mm -hmm. We may just put up the start of the new season as a Christmas present, and it will be put up on Christmas Day. Mm -hmm. Haven't decided yet. When is Hanukkah this year? Does it start on Christmas? Was that a meme I saw, or was that actual information I'm remembering? Hanukkah. Ha! Yep. Yep. Begins Christmas Eve and ends New Year's Eve. <laughs> so it will be both a Christmas present and a Hanukkah present. There you go. Which means I don't get a tree this year. Oh, darn. Wait, the... the uh, so, okay, so because my, my dad was raised Jewish and my mom was raised Catholic, there was a thing when I was growing up where if Christmas and Hanukkah coincided... We didn't get the tree because we had the menorah, and because the menorah was, you know, live flame. Oh, yeah. We didn't want the tree up. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and we had a very small apartment, because the menorah went in the window, and the tree went in the window, so we couldn't have them both at the same time. So, until next time, sleep tight. Don't let the warlocks bite. Bye! Bye! Hashtag anti-share in 2016. Nope.